Great. Well, it's super to be with you all. Um, this is Jim here. Rob is going to begin the talk, and we, we've we just done a screen share, and it's really super to be with everybody tonight and share in some of the more exciting explorations mm -hmm. that we've been part of. So over to Rob. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> um, the title has shifted slightly. Um, what we're trying to do is to report on some recent research. Um, as you know, we work in environmental education and education for sustainable development. And much of my work has been on African living landscapes and agroecology. And I'm sharing this work with Jim. What we're starting to realize is that we can draw on the biomonitoring heritage into the kind of work that Jim has been doing with the mini SAS and water monitoring. So this is a speculative and open-ended talk where we're going to be exploring um, the ideas that are sometimes difficult to understand. Um, and what I'm proposing is that these heritages in Africa in conservation are actually foundations for land care and for conservation. Um, and I want to stress how extremely difficult it is for us as people living in the modern era to picture Southern Africa in a different way to the way we see it now. It's difficult to picture it as um, indigenous cultural heritage of living landscapes transformed by colonial modernity. <laughs> and um, the we've all grown up within the residue of colonial perspectives and the empirical dialectic of modern scientific reasoning. Science tends to reason in oppositions. This means that we mostly are taught to think in ways that oppose things. And we separate people and nature. This comes naturally to us. Um, there are movements today that try to connect people and nature much more, like in environmental education. But we read landscapes as natural ecosystems. We think of natural ecosystems surrounding us rather than cultural landscapes surrounding us. Cultural landscapes that have taken thousands of years for people to develop. And we see conservation as protecting wildlife habitats from people. So all of these are barriers to becoming much more engaged with the history and cultures of African sustainability and bringing them into the present. So we do this in inclusive learning processes through ESD and environmental education. And what we're going to try to do tonight is flip oppositional thinking. So we start thinking about using indigenous heritage, history, and science to uncover and recover knowledge that in the words of Jean and Lope, the, um, the poet, we try to touch the past with our memories to feel the future flying on the wings of imagination. Now, if we go straight into the um, climate of Southern Africa. We know that Southern Africa is an area of climate extremes. We talk about climate change today, but some of the leading um, climate scientists are saying, you know, that we've al always had high climate variability, mainly because of the ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation that affects the climate here. And the variability has meant that people have been adapting to climate variability for centuries. We have, for instance, the intertropical convergence zone. We have the Southern Indian Ocean cyclonic system, which was playing up last week. We have the Southern Ocean frontal systems that come over regularly. Um, we had one just the other day. And of course, we have the cold currents and the upwelling, as well as the um, Kalahari um, high pressure system um, that has a great influence in the um, in the winter period. So if we've got these systems that are all um, operating 
over the Southern African um, areas, then it is going to be an area of high climate variability. And the climate extremes and variability that we can expect with anthropogenic climate change are only going to increase. So we have got the Ziwa up in the Nyanga area of northeastern Zimbabwe. There's ample evidence of the processes that for centuries they've shaped landscapes. Then we have the um, Chishona speaking people um, in the central plateau of Zimbabwe, um, in the Moyombo woodland systems. We have the um, people in Mpumalanga um, overlooking um, the Kruger, um, many of whom, they're like the Bokoni, disappeared in the transition to colonial modernity. Then, of course, we have the Zulu today in Zululand, and we have the Tosa, and many other groups of um, people who have come to produce landscapes in which they are culturally embedded and within which they have lived for hundreds of years, producing them um, as cultural landscapes. Now, let's look at some evidence of this. If we take um, uh, Maressa's work in um, 1987, drawing on some of the work that was done in the 30s, um, he proposes that there are um, areas where people lived, and around that there are zones of permanent cultivation, there was fallow cultivation, and there was bush and hunting and collecting, and these um, tribal figurations lived side by side. Uh, one of the best examples that I've seen in the archaeological literature has been the rock engravings of the Bokoni, where in their homesteads you can see that sort of pattern and the pathways, which illustrates that people operated with geographical insights and they were able to map long before the colonial mapping of Southern Africa occurred. Um, so we've got, in Chegwaderi's terms, if we go to the genealogical record in Southern Africa, we've got land taming that shaped networks of village as survival units, the villages um, as agroecological landscapes of Southern Africa. So this language is coming in now, rather than talking about ecology and people as if they're sort of opposing to each other, agroecological landscapes um, tend to be what is coming out around the idea of land taming and the historiography of the peoples of Southern Africa. So we've got sustainability practices and we've got land ethics. Um, John, who we might hope to meet, John um, uh, might be joining us later. He's been doing a lot of work on um, ethics and land care ethics. It was really important in the village households where you have the cattle kraals, the Izala dumps, if we look at the Zulu, the arable lands and water. And we had people shaping landscapes as expanding agroecological cultural landscapes. So they were working within the ecosystem limits. They were living in sustainable ways. And they were gathering in Mufino, they were using fire to affect their, the quality of their um, grazing and they were hunting. And these systems on the African savanna are really important, and we can talk about them as mosaic biocultural systems. And um, you have the dry forest, the open woodland, and the grassland. And particularly on the central plateau, if you look at the Moyombo, it's a fire climax system with over 50 edible species of plants. Their fruits were harvested from November to February, and over centuries of agroecological and climatic interaction, Southern Africa developed as living landscapes within which village survival units learned to thrive. And of course, this was disrupted by the imperial project of Europe. Now, if we go to the Moyombo, you can see, if we look at that as a, um, a, a seasonal cycle, you had from November through to February, you had fruits and geophytes, foods that were available in the wild. You had the grasses for cattle from um, February onwards. And then you had the fruits available 
from June and July through. So you start seeing that there's a pattern um, of food availability that enabled people to thrive in Southern Africa. If you look at the Mapani and people used to go down from the Moyombo into the Lofelt when the Nagana cattle disease um, carried by the tsetse fly enabled them to do that in the winter. And if you look at the winter in May, June and July, you find that fruits and geophytes were available in the Lofelt. So they were available in November to February in the High Felt, and people could journey and thrive in Southern Africa. Um, and of course, the flowering time was from August to November in the lower areas. So you start seeing then that water um, at the um, uplands occurred uh, for a longer period. And then you had the dry winter season. In the low felt, you had a shorter season and a longer dry winter season. Now, if we look at this in a little bit more detail, we start really respecting the situation in Southern Africa. And this work was derived from Earthy in 1933. And it looks at the um, coastal and Limpopo area around where we find the Tonga today. So what we've got is um, they would collect and hunt um, wild fruits uh, from October to February. And then they would grow sorghum and cassava because it's a hot coastal area. And there were certain times when they stored the food, when they prepared and planted the lands, and when they weeded the lands. And then they'd harvest and store the food in particular ways. Maize came in. It's a crop that came in and changed the food system, um, allowing its, its high energy foods the sweet potatoes, the pumpkins and calabashes, the beans and peas. So you start seeing that from earlier times when people depended on wild foods, they were really inventive and creative and produced the foods that were necessary for them to thrive. So as we're working with these data, looking at the living landscapes, we're starting to see that there was this dynamic, this process of land taming that occurred. And you're able to now tie that to sustainable ecological practices or sustainable cultural living landscape practices, like the seed sharing for plant diversity. Um, I've actually got some of the original maize that was brought in, tiny, tiny little cobs. And now we get the big cobs of today because culturally what we did and what the people of Southern Africa did is they actually saved and improved the seed over time. You have the Izala composting, which was originally wild plants and then used from the sweepings into the vegetable gardens. You had the um, mycorrhizal being used to move plants from forests into village communities, particularly by the Zinyanga and Sangomas. And um, this was tied to the ecological processes in the coastal forest. You had the Ukugelesha, the capturing of water in the soil, where when um, at coming up now in two months' time, when you're able to, able to see Orion's belt in the, in the um, heavens, people would clear their lands after harvesting, put the cattle in, and then they would break the soil so that it would capture water. Um, and then, of course, the mifino, the um, collecting of wild foods early on. And then now when people weed their gardens, um, particularly in the Eastern Cape, they don't dig out any old weeds willy-nilly. They keep the mifino because those are food plants. And umfuno, the plants, the vegetables that they have planted, and imifino, the wild plants, grow side by side. So what Jim and I started to realize is that we could bring this into our education programs, and we were able to start looking at modern irrigation in relation to a process of story sharing. It'll be great when you hear about stories next week. 
um, inquiry, investigative work that the students will do together, discussion and deliberation on problems, and then change projects. So this is becoming the kind of work that we're doing um, with uh, simple irrigation um, in an agricultural process, drawing on the heritage of the agroecology of Southern Africa. And now as we transition into looking at this powerful heritage of indigenous knowledge and its relationship with biomonitoring, you can see that the soil, land, water relationships that people had were tied over centuries of land care. And even the young children used to make cattle um, when they were herding the cattle. And the indigenous people um, had a tremendous richness because they called themselves Nguni only quite recently, actually, because this identified them as cattle people. So if we go on to the idea of biomonitoring in heritage, although it wasn't known as citizen science at the time, in those days, biomonitoring as an indigenous heritage has been integral to the living landscapes of Southern Africa for hundreds, if not thousands of years. For instance, people living in rural in villages were able to read the changing seasons. And there's lots of evidence of this. They were able to anticipate the arrival of the seasonal foods, as we saw with the phonology maps that I showed you earlier. They were able to assess water quality so as to collect clean water for their daily life use. And these are some of the things that are necessary for us to think about in terms of citizen science. Um, Jim told me the other day that they used to listen to the water. And of course, we know from modern science that dripping water and water that is um, coming out of the rocks becomes very rich in oxygen and therefore it's very pure and clean. So listening to the water was a good place to collect Amanzam Nandi, sweet water, if we look at the Zulu. And they were able to look for living water. They would look at life in the water and some life would indicate to them this was good water to collect and they would clear the surface to collect Amanzam Nandi. They could hear when it was safe to collect water because if they heard frogs, it wasn't safe to collect water. But modern ecology tells us that frogs are indicative of good water, but not to indigenous people. If you're barefoot and you're walking and they're frogs, well, there are also puff adders and night adders there, and it isn't a safe place to collect water. So people going to a frog area of good water would be very vigilant when they went there. They would um, know when to collect in pools away from the seasonal polluting of the rivers because the rivers would come down and for three days people would not collect water from the rivers or from some springs because the feces that was in the pastures would be washed into the river. So they would collect from rock pools. There also was um, murky water in the pools at this time. They would use ash and they would scatter ash on, at the sacred pools. Ash is a flocculant and it allows the sediment to reach down into the, into the water and um, produces lovely clear water so that people could um, look for the living water and would, that would be a good place for them to collect. They would keep the animals away from the sacred springs and the sweet water. So Jim has been drawing on this work on heritage, and he has been taking it up into the mini SAS so that people are saying biomonitoring, it's not some new scientific invention for citizen science. It's actually part of our heritage in Africa. And now Jim is going to open up some of the stories around this for you. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much, Rob. And it's wonderful to be with all of you tonight sharing these ideas. I just thought I would define the word biomonitoring. Remember, bio is a word from Latin, which means life. So when you do monitoring, that is biomonitoring, it means life monitoring. 
it's not the kind of monitoring that you might do where you do a grab sample of water, where you do a chemical or a physical analysis of the water. Biomonitoring is about life monitoring. So here we have some farmers from Kwanuhuka, which is a catchment not far from here. They were analyzing their river and they had a lot of indigenous knowledge about the river. But um, by collecting macroinvertebrates um, from the river, these small creatures like um, stoneflies and mayflies and damselflies, they were able to find indicator organisms that tell us the story of the river. So if you know about the macroinvertebrates, you can read what the river is in effect telling you. Some creatures, some little macroinvertebrates are very sensitive to pollution. So they will die off if the river's polluted. But if you can find them, it could be indicative that the stream is of, of, of healthy condition. And this is how these farmers are analyzing and reading their rivers so they know where they can collect water safely for their families, where their cattle can go and drink water and so on. So here's another group of people. They've caught some macroinvertebrates. They've got them in a tray. They use those nets to collect them. And they're busy analyzing them using a simple dichotomous key. Um, we've identified 13 uh, macroinvertebrates that are indicator organisms and actually tell us the story of the, the stream that we're studying. The, we've also developed a phone app. And the fascinating thing about this app is that it's based on machine learning and you can take a photograph of the organism you find and it will give you um, an, a suggestion as to which creature you are finding. But better than that, every creature it sees, it builds it into its memory bank and then it's, it improves its ability to tell us what, um, what creature we're finding. So although we may be working practically in streams and rivers, by using modern technology, we can enhance the analysis of the creatures that we're finding. And it also geolocates us. In other words, it pinpoints where we're working. It, it analyzes the organisms we're finding and it starts to offer us a river health index for that stream or river. The fantastic thing about this is you don't need a laboratory, you don't need a, um, a grab sample or have to send off your results to an expert. And we found even a child who's maybe not strong in, in English, um, perhaps a nine-year-old Isizulu speaking child can analyze the stream and get an idea of what's going on there. So this app is available for free, and it's from the website, which is simply minisas.org. You just type that into Google. It takes you straight into the website, and it offers you a chance to download the app onto your phone. We, um, we'll repeat that website link a bit later in this talk. So what you can then do, and the app will help you, is load your results onto Google Earth. And this is a Google Earth plane customized for mini SAS. And if you look carefully, you can see the Orange River flowing all the way to the West Coast. The biggest river in, um, in South Africa and Southern Africa, south of the Zambezi. And you can see it winding all, at, all the way to Aranyamont and Alexandra. And that river has been analyzed by citizen scientists all the way as well as the Senku River, which rises in Lesotho and then flows into the Orange. Also, you can see in the north of this picture, um, the Gauteng area where the Baal River drains from Mpumalanga also into this river. So there are little crab icons on this map, and each icon ranges from purple, which means highly modified or poor quality water, through five stages to blue, which means it's good quality. And on the Google Earth plane, you can click on each of these icons. It will tell you about the quality. It will tell you who did the collection, when they did it, and you can collect many times over in the same place. So you might like to collect a sample in summer, contrast that with winter, for example. Um, 
And this is a close up. You can, in the Google Earth plane, you can cho choose satellite view. This is the town where Rob and I are speaking to you from. It's a town of Howick. On the left hand side of the screen is Midmar Dam. And you can see the water coming out of Midmar is scoring low in biomonitoring because the creatures don't survive well in unnatural uh, dams. But sadly, as it flows through the town, the quality gets worse. It gets to a purple condition, and then it comes out and it goes into a nature reserve. And as it flows through the nature reserve, the natural processes clean the river, and it improves from a red color at the beginning all the way to a orange color, which means it's it's getting better. So we often use the slogan, and Rob coined this, a healthy river cleans itself better than a polluted river. So that's quite an exciting insight on, on these rivers and streams. So that's a close-up view, and you can use satellite view anywhere in, in the world, actually, to see who's um, done a river health index and what sort of findings they have. But there are other ways of adding to your biomonitoring. Um, the first one that we're screening now is a clarity tube. Um, Mrs. Ungobani is using it here to monitor the water clarity, what scientists call turbidity of a stream near her. And she monitors the wastewater outflow from the Shia Bazali uh, wastewater treatment works. And then the next one we have here is an example of biomonitoring that I've already spoken of. And then finally, the velocity plank, which measures the stream velocity and volume. And when you've got flooding conditions like we've just had in Durban, it's fantastic to get an idea of the power of the water, measure the volume, measure the velocity, and, and understand the streams and river better. So as you've heard from Rob's talk, much of this knowledge is goes way back to our ancestors, but these simple tools are helping complement the indigenous knowledge practices of the past and how we can use them in the present. We also are hoping to have John Burakeni with us tonight. Um, John Burakeni is doing research in Afrophilia. And if you like, Afrophilia means love of Africa and being African. It's a research response to Afro-pessimism. And you will meet many, many people, both African people and people in Europe um, or people in North America, even like uh, former President Donald Trump, who's got really, really bad things to say about Africa. Well, we can live in African pessimism, or we can draw on the rich heritage of Africa, the phenomenal biodiversity that Africa has, and realize that it's probably the best place on earth to live. And Afrophilia is this idea of research that tells the story of Afrophilia. I'd just like you to read this statement with me, where a moral imperative of care and respect can be expanded to include the wider than human within a shared duty to activate change for a common good. What a phenomenal interpretation that is of Ubuntu or the idea of people are people through other people. And finally, what maybe sums up the whole talk that Rob and I have shared with you tonight is learning to look after others to best care for ourselves and the surroundings we all share. Well, we hope you've enjoyed some of the images we've shared with you. And we are super enthusiastic about this work and really invite you to join up in any way you can and strengthen your understanding of the world around you and the conservation of the resources. Yeah, thank you all very much for being with us tonight. Please, people, um, feel free to post any questions that you may have in the chat, or even better, if you want to just raise your hands, if you'll look at the bottom of the screen under the reaction tools, there is a um, option to raise your hand. And then um, once you raise your hand, we will um, take your, your question. Um, or if you don't want to ask a question live, and then you can just post it in the chat and then we will ask the, the questions of the of the guys or anybody else um, who may want to also add. I see Tom um, has, has got his hand up. So welcome, Tom. Uh, Marit, if you can unmute Tom, please. 
and then we'll start with his question. Good morning. Thanks. Sorry, I was late to the party here. Uh, and maybe you've already done this, but can you give us or give me more details on where to find information, specific information about the tools you use for biomonitoring, specifically the the, uh, the rivers and such? Or do you have a turnkey program or toolkit that is uh, available? Because I, I also want to uh, establish some citizen science projects, both here in the United States and in Kenya. And that sounds very, very helpful. Yeah, great. Thank you very much for that question. We, we have written a book with the on 10 citizen science tools, but the quickest way to get to them is we've placed them in the website and maybe somebody could type, Rob, could you type? The website is simply minisas.org. And if you go straight into Google and type that, you don't need any other figures. Um, it will open the website and then it will take you to the support tools and resources that you can get. Now, some of these you can buy and some of these you can make yourself. So we found that people make a homemade net to collect creatures. And also don't forget, once you've collected the creatures and analyzed them, let them go back where you found them so that they aren't harmed in any way. So, so you collect them with a net, you analyze them, and then you put them back in the stream. And um, I see Rob is typing in the website name now. He's typing quite slowly. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure why that is. It's sort of a one, forgive us for being one finger typist. <laughs> uh, but there you've got minisas.org. Have a look at that website and you'll find them there. And then Rob, if you could just put my email address in, please. Um, shall I type? It'll be slightly yeah. quicker here. Um, uh, my email address, and you can write to me anytime I can send you a copy of the book. Um, Oh dear, um, this isn't minisas.org. Let's um, enter. Yeah. And then here comes Jim Taylor, 835 at gmail.com. Um, by all means, write to that address and I'll send you the kinds of copies of the 10 tools that we've been um, we've been researching, experimenting with. And remember that all of this is in a trial. It's all getting better all the time. There's nothing that's been perfected. So, for example, that app that we only released last month, it's we're still finding gremlins with the app. And we're inviting everybody, all of you, to try it out yourselves and give us feedback on how we can make it better. And the same with these citizen science tools. I know in the United States, um, there are really sophisticated citizen science tools that we would love to learn from. So please share ideas and let's build a collaborative community of practice around understanding the world around us better and seeking to care for it a little better than we have for the last hundred years or so. Thank you. Are you the Thank you, Jim and Rob. Are you the Thanks. Uh, I mean, I'm having enough trouble coping with one Jim Taylor, let alone 865 of them. <laughs> hey, uh, Rob makes a joke of that, but if you ever choosing uh, uh, an email address, you've got to get rid of um, numbers like I, like one and letters like I, because they can be confused and then everyone get confused. So that's why 835 was chosen with this um, email address. <laughs> and that's well, thanks, just a little joke tonight. That's why. <laughs> thanks, Jim. So yeah, Tom, uh, please do go have a look at those websites and download the materials. And uh, have fun, have fun um, getting getting some new tools for your for your research and your analysis. Thanks. I see Emlyn has his hand up, so uh, welcome, Emlyn. Nice to have you. Um, if uh, Marit can just unmute you, please, and then um, after that we'll go to the first questions in the chat. Um, please, will you will you? And there you go, Emlyn. Yes, thank you very much. Um, since there's been several mentions of citizen science, and um, I, I just want to mention briefly in case it's not known. To anybody on this great conversation that there is a us-based citizen science association which meets annually um, that brings forward best practices and experiences but i also wanted to share that i think the first reference to the term citizen science was in a in a, a marvelous compendium called planet under stress that was published by the royal society of canada in 1990 uh, a, a sort of a whole set of expert views about 
what we were beginning to know in 1990, what, 33, 40 years ago, uh, about the sort of dilapidating state of uh, the planet and human disturbance of the Earth system. And I just want to quote two things from it. I think they're inspirational. The preface to this book, Planet Under Stress, says uh, quite accurately that, quote, the human being is an animal that has moved out of ecological balance with its environment. And one of the short chapters, actually just two pages in this compendium, uh, was by a physicist, Ursula Franklin, at the University of Toronto, who said, and I've always memorized the quote, she said, the task of the future is to build relationships among and between citizens and scientists so the distinction between the two groups vanishes so that both become citizen scientists potentially able to solve our problems together. I think that's a very inspirational quote, and it's in the book called Citizen Science, published by the Royal Society of Canada, which is still available, at least from Amazon, and the uh, author was Ursula Franklin. Thanks very much, Emlyn. <clears throat> um, I believe I missed uh, Mike Bruton. You had your physical hand up. Sorry, I was looking for el electronic hands. So my apologies for that. But if you could unmute yourself when it pops up on your screen and um, ask your question, please. Yeah, my question to Rob and Jim is, are you aware of the work of Mutoni Musandi, who developed the Itiki drought uh, predictor. Uh, she grew up in a farm in Kenya where she observed that her father and uncles predicted important events uh, through their observations of what was going on in nature. But she also realized that some of their predictions were inaccurate. So she created this app which combines indigenous knowledge with um, modern scientific knowledge to improve their predictions. And uh, she did a PhD on the Tiki system at UCT, and she now works at the Central University of Technology in the Free State. And if you haven't heard of her work, I think it might be well worth getting in contact with her because she's bringing indigenous knowledge and science together in a very impressive way. Thank Gosh, you very much, I Mike. May I just say, it's wonderful to have Mike Bruton with us tonight. Um, um, Mark, I had not heard of her work, so perhaps if you could type her surname into the chat, uh, we can look it up. But if, if anyone has done more for citizen science in Southern Africa, few have done more than Mark Bruton. So great to have you here. And isn't this a wonderful forum um, where people, Jasper, where people can make the kind of observation that Mark makes and we can all learn from it. What better way to learn and share than have people like of the caliber of Mark Bruton with us. So thank you, Professor Bruton, for being in tonight. And I think Rob might have something quick to say. No, I was also very interested um, because of course, that's what the scientists have done, exactly what she has done. If you take the Eastern Cape, um, where we've been having cycles of drought since time immemorial. And um, they made the connection between the Enzo and that area, and also other parts of the planet as well. So um, it's very important not to draw a sharp distinction between indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge, to see them as part of the plural knowledges that we can draw on and bring together, as you say. I think that's really interesting. Um, I'd like to make a, <clears throat> a controversial um, statement out of the evidence that I shared today. I very much doubt that we would not have the ungulates of Africa unless we had the indigenous people of Africa. Because if you take the Moyombo as an example, the Muyombo was um, a woodland, thicket, and forest area. People opened it up. They opened it up into the uh, Mukuvisi type of landscape. The Mukuvisi landscape supported both cattle and wildlife. And if it wasn't for the Nagana, we wouldn't have had the break that kept people out of the low felt. So my hypothesis that is a little bit controversial is that the wildlife of Africa grew with the people of Africa. And it was the modern world that actually disrupted these relational dynamics. 
and produce the um, separations that we're trying to kind of navigate ourselves through. Um, but I'm right with you, Mike, in terms of the synergies between heritage and science are so yeah. close, particularly yeah. if you work with Roy Bascar's work. Roy Bascar, in his critical realism, produces the tools to see science not as something special and different, but see science as human knowledge creation alongside all of the human knowledge creation that has been part of the successes of people on the planet. Um, and only recently have we exceeded them and have we created the challenges that we've got these days. Yeah. So thanks for yeah. that. I'm 100% behind you. If I could just say I write, wrote about uh, Ms. Cindy's work in my book, Harambi, The um, Spirit of Innovation in Africa, which addresses a lot of the points that you've been making in your talk. Harambi, The Spirit of Innovation in Africa, published by the HSRC. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, appreciate your input. Um, I'm going to go to a couple of uh, just more comments in the chat. So at about 7.22, um, Sibyl Rittmiller did comment um, saying, these agroecological agro zones remind me of the, and excuse my Latin, Pisos Ecologicos, agricultural system of the Peruvian Incas 500 years ago in some niche areas still practiced today, which was farming at different levels of the Andean mountains with a great variety of crops adjusted at each level of altitude. So um, that more that's just more a statement or a comment. I'm not sure, um, Rob and Jim, if you want to comment on that. But also um, relates to the milpa um, of the same area, you know, of Central um, um, America. Um, where they grew the three sisters, you know, so there's wonderful agricultural heritage in those areas. And it's quite ironic that today we have got so much Andean um, potato diversity in um, Lesotho. And the researchers are coming over to look at the species of potato that were cultivated in the um, uh, what's it called? The Masakani, is it? Or um, uh, forget the name now of the agricultural system in um, in Lesotho. Lesotho. Someone might know it. And the potatoes there were um, Andean potatoes that had now no longer found in in the Andes. Hmm. So um, if you're able to look at it from a global point of view, that the biodiversity can be created over time. And, you know, the idea of biodiversity being lost is really quite an interesting challenge. Sure, it's being lost spatially, but there are so many areas that we could explore as scientists and as um, cultural historians to understand these ideas more deeply. Thanks, Rob. Um, our next uh, next um, comment is is basically a quote from a um, a person. Uh, I'm, I personally haven't heard of them, but I'm pretty sure that others would have. So it's just the practice of conservation must spring from a conviction of what is ethically and aesthetically right, as well as what is economically expedient. A thing is right only when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the community. And the community includes the soil, water, fauna, and flora, as well as people. And that is a quote by Aldo Leopold. I'm not too sure if uh, uh, Jim or Rob are familiar with that quote or is it um, in that the same, person. Is it in the same country, Al Almanac? I'm not too sure. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. Maybe if. if if Len right. wants to comment further or unmute himself. We we know that um, the Sand Country Almanac by Aldo Leopold okay. was one of the first books we read around a different way of connecting with nature and understanding humans and their relationships with nature. So that's really great. Was the other person going to comment um, there, Jasper? Or I have another question in the chat I'd like to pick up on, but I'm happy to pause for the other statement. 
No, no problem. I'm just wanting to go through the them in order, and then we'll we'll get to. I'm going to read through all of the. the uh, ones Marty, in the yes. Sorry for interrupting. Len is unmuted. If he wants. Okay, to perfect. Add. Len, uh, would you like to maybe just expand a bit um, on where that is? I think the guys have. No, I did, I, thanks, Marty. No, Jim and, and Rob. I just want to confirm that it does come from the San, Al San County Almanac and probably. Probably a publication that I read as a 12 or 13 year old that uh, certainly uh, fostered many, many thoughts. And I reflect, it, it still sits on my, very dog yet, but it still sits on my bookshelf today. But yes, confirming that it is from the same County Almanac. Thank you. No, thanks for, for sharing that. And uh, I think it's been a little while since you were 12. So <laughs> it's good that it's kept in your, in your, in your memory. <laughs> There's Sophia Luca has asked the question how the indigenous knowledge how is the indigenous knowledge linked to scientific research i'm not too sure i mean you have covered quite a bit of this and i think it was asked during the the talk but maybe if you can just um, elaborate a bit please yeah just um, a simple statement maybe to rattle our brains a little bit is that science is indigenous and it can only be indigenous all knowledge is situated. The nice thing about science is it came at a really important time when the practice of measuring and counting enabled us to overcome many of the limitations of earlier knowledge in the West. It's just such a, such a pity that when, when science came to Africa that it was separated from the people. And that's why in the talk tonight, when we were trying to explore these ideas, we were looking at biomonitoring and trying to make the connection between the way people lived in the world, looking at the biota around us and learning to see patterns is science. And when it is limited to institutions, um, then it becomes narrow and less useful and removed and outside of us. So the first person who spoke who mentioned the idea of citizen science and science as a single entity is this bringing of indigenous heritage as science and institutional science together into a melting pot of learning for the future um, particularly to address the challenges that we've got of biodiversity loss and also um, the um, anthropogenic climate change that we are confronted with today. I think to a large degree, our definition of what science is and the mindset needs to be shifted to <clears throat> not be science is something you learn out of a book and science is, as you say, in, in, in indigenous knowledge and life experience of people over many years and just because it's never been written down doesn't mean it's not science yeah absolutely marty and i would like to share just one anecdote um where i grew up in kwazulu natal my friends used to um speak about the bird um the cuckoo that said in um english or afrikaans people would call it pit may fro um, and Isizulu people used to say, Peskom kom, kitim beu. Peskom kom, kitim beu. Now, what that meant is when that cuckoo moved into the area, it was time to prepare your fields, sow your, sow your corn. So hmm. there was people reading uh, messages from birds. Now, you can't say that's not science. I mean, it, it might not always be the right thing to do, um, but these kinds of cues come from nature and we can pick up on them and um and learn to connect whereas often um traditional western science taught us that it was superior and the local knowledge wasn't um as as important and that is such an unfor unfortunate distinction you know instead of building the togetherness that we've heard from so many people tonight in this show um if we if we strive together, we can get a lot further than having the oppositional thinking that Rob mentioned in the beginning of the talk, which is so much um, 
part of a more colonial view of of how we can live together. Thank you, Marty. Thanks, thanks, Jim, for that. Um, Sandra Hardy's asked a, a question, and uh, you did touch on um, the the indigenous um, sort of experience and knowledge about frogs, but she's asking: Do frogs have influence on the quality of water? She notes that she lives on a farm outside St. Francis Bay, and they have regular frog migrations. Um, so maybe if you can just comment on that. Do... Yeah, it's always one of the jokes that I share with the students um, that, you know, the um, I try to get people to think outside of the pol polarity. So I sort of say, look, um, indigenous people say if they're frogs, it's not a good place to collect water. Scientists say if they're frogs, then the water quality is normally good. Now, which is right? And then we do voting, you know, and the students say, you know, must definitely be the scientist. The indigenous knowledge is wrong. But what's important to realize in this little joke is it is the frame of reference that counts. So if you've got a frame of reference in relation to water quality as potable water, and you've got a frame of reference as a place that is safe, then both knowledges are right. Um, the, there has been quite a lot of work done in Cape Town on, on the frog migrations, and there are wonderful people there who save frogs from cars um, and starting to put in migration pathways. Um, it, it, it's a seasonal thing, but um, mostly um, my limited knowledge is that where you find frogs, you normally have um, good quality, certainly without um, toxins. So you might have very high nutrient, but um, you probably don't have toxins there. And That's maybe an just to, to try, try and go back to a question, uh, do the frogs actually have any influence on the quality of the water? And I'm thinking their excrement or um, eggs or anything like that, do those things affect the quality of the water? Um, uh, um, I'd like to put that question to Professor Bruton. I hope that's why he's raised his hand. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, Mike, let, can you come in there? <laughs> let's ask him to unmute. No, I raised my hand to uh, to <laughs> mention another point. I wouldn't want to risk an answer on frogs. <laughs> so I, I have an eco pool in my garden, and it has at least seven frog species in it. And it's had uh, it, it. The water quality has varied over the years, and the frogs have thrived. So they're actually pretty tolerant of a wide range of conditions. So I'm not sure they would be an accurate predictor. Thanks, uh, Professor Mike. Um, uh, if anyone else has any uh, frog knowledge, um, please raise your hand. Uh, but we'll let uh, Prof. Uh, Bruton ask his question that he had intended to ask. Shall I go ahead? Yes, go for it. Yeah, I want to mention an interesting um, um, example from traditional fishing methods, which I've studied in some detail. Um, as you know, uh, traditionally fish traps and so on are made from natural fibers, which if they're lost in a flood, um, rot away and don't continue to catch uh, fish and, and shellfish. Um, the modern nets that have been developed, nylon gill nets and, and so on, continue to catch even after they lost. And the current estimate is that the commercial catch of fishes in marine and fresh waters is about the same as the, um, the number of fishes and shellfish lost through ghost fishing of last hmm. year. And as a result, some countries have implemented policies where it's compulsory that at least one face of your lobster trap or crab trap um, or fish trap has to be made from biodegradable um, natural fibers so that if the gear is lost at sea, that uh, face of it will rot away and it won't continue to act as a trap. I think that's a nice way you know, of combining uh, traditional practices with destructive modern practices and coming up with a policy that 
preserves biodiversity. Lovely example. Thanks, Mike. Thanks very much. I do not see any other hands up to answer our frog questions. So I think, um, Sandra, if you're feeling brave, maybe you can go and test some of your uh, frog water and give us feedback another time if you survive. <laughs> um, <coughs> I'm just going, there is a message with um, uh, greetings from Edem Ediang, Eniang, sorry. Um, greetings from Nigeria. I have enjoyed the lecture. We are doing lots of citizen science at BPC Nigeria. It's a great way to go. Can we have some of the tools here in Nigeria? So I think the guys will say to you, please go to the website that they shared earlier and download um, from the website for any tools or resources but um, I'll give you another option or opportunity to to talk further to that if there's anything specific for Nigeria that you can think of yeah I just think that's that's a super point that he makes from Nigeria and um, we've learned so much from Nigerian citizen scientists uh, but the the tools we have developed together are free um, to download from the website that we mentioned earlier. So let's all work together and um, experiment with them wherever we live and work and, and share this knowledge. I mean, I just think that example that Mike Bruton shared of um, using indigenous knowledge to produce um, modern um, catching nets that can biodegrade is just superb. And we can all learn together I'd like to pick up on the next question from Luke Hall. Um, greetings, Luke, from TUT. Good to have you on this evening. And he makes a fascinating point about Mpopomeni informal settlement. Um, he's quite right to say that Mpopomeni is a township just above Midmar Dam. And for many years, most of the effluent and pollution flowed from that township into the dam. And um, in 2009, with the support of DACT and the Mkungendlovu District Municipality, a group of people living in the township started monitoring the sewerage outflows and doing door-to-door -door education around it. And after three years of work, um, when they initially started monitoring, there were 104 sewerage um, spills into, into the um, Mtumzima stream, which flows into Midmar. And after three years of working, there was not one flowing into that stream. So working with Amgani Water, with the Department of Water and Sanitation and other authorities, they were able to overcome that. And today there's a human-made wetland between the township and Midmar Dam, which is uh, mitigating to up to 60% the kind of pollutants that are going into Midmar. So um, really exciting nature-based solution there. But I would like to say that probably 60% of the risk to Midmar is from agriculture and uh, the nutrient load that comes off agricultural lands is even higher than what is coming out of the townships. So Luke, um, spot on with your insights and question there. And by all means, pick it up with us um, in, an, in another forum if you'd like to go deeper into it. If you look on the MINISAS website globally, the most studied region of the world, believe it or not, using MINISAS is the Mpopomeni Valley. And that's mainly Isizulu people using the citizen science and documenting their work onto the Google Earth plane. So hats off to that incredible community mobilization not far from Hawaii. Thank you, Luke. Thanks, uh, Jim, and thanks, Luke, for the question. I'm just interested in um, the um, filtration um, of the, the the water that's coming out of the, the township. Was that something that naturally occurred, or was it specifically um, planted to, to, to do the filtration? I'm just interested. Yeah, so the idea there is the farmers uh, back... About 70 years ago, farmers near Mpopomeni canalized the streams and they made the streams straight so that they had more arable land. What that meant is when you had a flood, it just rushed with all the sand and soil and soil erosion straight into the dam. 
And on the way, it picked up the coliform bacteria from human and animal feces and everything just got washed straight into the dam. The, the wetland, they, they've carefully blocked off the stream and they spread the water over the landscape so that the reeds and the plants have time to, um, um, to take on and, and, and reduce the kinds of uh, pollution, pollutant, pollutant load that's going into Midmar. And the water is much cleaner than it was before that wetland was used as a as a kind of filter, if you like, um, helping clean that um, the water from the from the um, in Popomeni Township. Thanks, Jim. Um, Cheryl, I, I know you've written a couple of comments in there. I would like to ask you to unmute if you can. So I'll. Um because you, you always bring so much energy, positive energy to the talk. So please, won't you um, express your, your your comments yourself, um, Cheryl? I know these two young men for many years. <laughs> and I think they've watched me go grey over the years. I mean, I was a young girl when I started my first ESA conference. And guys, you, you helped mould me. And um, thank you. That's all I can say. The last couple of years, you've helped me mold my students as well. And thank you. And tonight was a fantastic talk as always. You two are called my, my twins, all right, because you make such a big difference in conservation, in environmental education. And you're just showing what um, it is. Never give up. Thank you. And then just, just a tip that um, <clears throat> Cheryl didn't mention their message to her students. This presentation will be included in your first theory. Um, don't forget to view the Changing Hearts and Minds series. Jim and Rob, talk is number 13. <laughs> so all the, the TUT students pay attention and you'll you'll get ahead. I see, Mike, you, you've got your, your hand up again, so I'll allow you to unmute, please. Yeah, sorry to butt in again, but I recently published a paper in the South African Journal of Science on the incredible role that citizen scientists have played in discovering a coelacanth colony off the south coast of KwaZulu-Natal, um, uh, over 300 kilometers south of the Isimangalisa Wetland Park, where we already knew there were coelacanths. And the reaction of the editor of the South African Journal of Science is she'd like to invite a group of scientists to write an article for publication in the journal on the importance of citizen science in South Africa. So maybe um, you know, Rob and Jim and, and some other participants in this discussion would, would like to join me in putting together a paper that emphasizes the important role of citizen scientists and how we can further develop their contributions uh, to science. That's a thumbs up and uh, thanks Mike for bringing that to our attention. And I'm sure you will be able to get in touch with each other to to collaborate on that submission. Marty, could I pick up on the next one by Claudia? Uh, that perfect. I was going to read it, but by all means, um, do you want to read it out and then um, answer? Sort of the idea that um, biology and indigenous wisdom is very often combined. Now, um, Sol Shava, a colleague of mine, who's now Professor Shava at um, UNISA, he did a very interesting study on the history of the combinings of biology and indigenous wisdom. And one of the challenges here that um, Catherine Odora Hoppers raises is that when biology combined indigenous wisdom and brought it back into the school curriculum, the children did not recognize it as indigenous anymore. Because what actually happened was science appropriates the knowledge and turns it into scientific abstract ideas. And therefore, the connections are actually lost for indigenous people. So that is one of the major um, cultural limitations of the way science is working at the moment. And citizen science intervenes at that space to bring the science out of the life experience of people and into the scientific world, and from the scientific world into the life of people. So that as was mentioned earlier, 
the sciences of daily life and knowledge creation and the science of the laboratory kind of start to interact much more closely. So that's a really useful um, question to raise, um, Claudia, to actually look at, you know, the, the idea that science can become indigenous knowledge and knowledge for the citizenry if it is done differently. Yeah, and Claudia, you might like to look up the term, um, the research approach called decolonial research. And just Google it, decolonial research, and you'll be amazed how, um, how many people are now trying to look at decolonial perspectives. And for me, what it means is that um, you learn strangely in this world um, if you if you believe implicitly that you're not a racist and you're going around saying I'm not a racist, it probably means you are a racist. If you go around saying I'm not a colonial person and I'm I'm beyond being colonial, it probably means you are. So for many of us, it's a quest to overcome these social tendencies um, of colonialization and racism and the kinds of prejudices that are all around us. But programs like tonight is phenomenal for actually building linkages across these different um, predispositions, these habitual ways of thinking, and the separateness that you often see in society. And I think that's where Rob started tonight, seeing others as other instead of us as one people on earth trying to live more sustainably and oppositionalizing everything. This, this is good, that's bad, and so on and seeking this, uh, a greater sense of unity um, where different perspectives can, in a plural world, contribute to um, more sustainable living. Yeah, is an amazing um, sort of theme coming out of this, the kinds of insights you're all sharing with us. Thank you all so much. Young people are even coming up with new language like pluriversity, plural diversities in cultural settings. So, you know, we live and learn in a changing world and it's fun. So just to add to that, um, Cheryl has shared another book that um, she feels is worth sharing, uh, The Community Engagement Research in South Africa, which is by Van Eerden, Ilof and Dipenar, and it's pretty hot off the press uh, from, nine, from 2022. So please, um, have a look there have a look in the chat if you're wanting to um get get some more um uh, information about um the community engagement research um i see your hand is up mike i'll quickly read the last two comments and then we'll come back um to you so um liesel van us has um said the deep ecology movement began in 1972 with the norwegian philosopher arne Neus. It can be defined as a social movement aimed towards a philosophical, philosophical shift <clears throat> named that humans, sorry, namely that humans should stop viewing nature as a resource and begin to view it as something with inherent value. And she says, please also explore this too. And then the last comment on the, the comments at the moment, um, Tom Tochterman says, interesting, science co-opting traditional methods and knowledge. What impact will this have on the business of Sangomas? So after you've answered that question, then we'll go back to Mike Bruton. Yeah, um, just on Arnie Ness, first of all, um, he's written some wonderful stuff. Um, and I regularly go to Norway now because I've got a grandson there, um, Anderson. Um, and I, I read this book by Knut Hansen. Um, and he wrote this growth of soil. And it actually illustrates how the Norwegian rural areas were created um, and some of the conflicts that were there. And I think that was probably what influenced Arne Ness in terms of this philosophical shift. It was um, in the Oslo intellectual spaces at the turn of the century. And he... Um, you know, there were a lot of exploratory type of work that was done, and he retreated up to the mountains. So um, I will look forward to spending some 
of the early next winter up in the mountains of Norway and uh, take Arnie Ness with me. Um, in terms of the Sangomas, um, one of the things that I always did with my students was to say to them, um, when they came and badgered me about they want to study indigenous knowledge, I said, look, I'm pink. Okay, I go pinker when I get into the sun. I'm not of Africa, and you want to come and study indigenous knowledge. Um, you can, I'm really happy because Ireland, my home country, was colonized by the British and oppressed. So I feel it for the oppression that you feel in relation to African conditions. But um, I will not supervise anything related to the Sangomas and Izinyangas, because that is a transgression of the indigenous knowledge. And I think one of the dangers is that science has trans transgressed to kind of like overcome some of the um, indigenous heritage work. Um, and there needs to be, and there is in certain sectors, much more co-engaged work. Um, I, I went to India once and I, I worked at um, reviewing the um, indigenous knowledge um, in, of medicine in India. Um, and they are now working much more closely with the um, medical sciences. And they were even doing genetic typing in the um, uh, indigenous research in, um, in India. So there's, there's tremendous um, work. And what we must avoid is there's lots of indigenous knowledge that is there um, that goes beyond medicinal plants. It irks me no end when um, someone says, um, here we are. Um, we want to study indigenous knowledge. Let's look at medicinal plants. That's the first core. You know, we there's so much more vast, interesting um, indigenous knowledge than medicine. And I think medicine should be off limits for people who are not doctors and pharmacists and Sangomas and Izinyanga, because there's been so much poor work done, particularly around the African potato and the HIV AIDS and, and that sort of thing. Thanks, Jim. Do you also want to add something? I see you've moved closer, or can we move to Prof. Uh, Bruton? Across to Prof. Bruton, I think. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I want to make what might sound like a controversial statement and, and to say that there is no such thing as Western science, and we shouldn't use that term. Just as is, there isn't African science or Islamic science, all of these different cultures make contributions to science and there can only be one science. And the, the principles of, of physics and chemistry and so on apply wherever you are. So, you know, we need to get away from referring to Western science and contrasting it with indigenous knowledge. The other point I'd like to make is that a knowledge system, however it's derived or passed on from one generation to another, only imparts benefits if it creates wisdom and it's not enough to just create information or knowledge that must be converted into wisdom the the wise use of that knowledge and i think there are many examples in the world of what we traditionally call science producing information and knowledge that hasn't led to wisdom whereas i think there are many examples in indigenous knowledge uh, which have imparted wisdom and i think we need to recognize that Thanks uh, for that valuable input. Uh, again, you've been coming in a number of times and we appreciate that. Thank you very much. There's just a couple more points. There are more comments than, than questions. And um, we, we're almost at uh, half past eight. I'm not too sure. Um, <clears throat> we, we've still got a few people in the room up to still at 49. So let me let me read these last two. And then if anyone has got a further question, please won't you um, to, uh, just, just put it in the, uh, in the chat or raise your hand. But uh, Gili de Vlieg says, thank you for pointing out how arrogant the colonial mindset can be and how we need to rid ourselves of this arrogance on a daily basis. 
I have been fortunate to work with many rural communities in the past, and their ideas have enriched my life. And then Rob Motzer says, <clears throat> uh, wonderful points. Thank you for your presentation. In the U.S., there are people who are creating language, presentations, nonprofits, projects, and essays for the rights of nature and our connections, symbiosis, and the wisdom of ind indigenous knowledge. I'm one of those people involved in this work and write wet wildlands and have a habitat restoration group. So thanks, uh, Robin, for your um, efforts in the U.S. to um, to do these um, these these initiatives. I don't know if there's anyone else. Uh, there's Robin there on the on the screen. <laughs> thanks. I'm not sure if there's any comment from Rob or Jim um, on that. I just thank you for the opportunity to have um, been here today, um, this evening, and um, the challenge of trying to synthesize these ideas and share them in ways that um, provoke and invite and challenge. Yeah, and just from me, just to also um, thank you, Marty, for steering us so beautifully tonight, but also for all the contributions and um, um, what fun to have co-presenting with um, Professor Mark Bruton at, and um, people who I've always learned from, like Len van Skalkveig. Thank you, Len. And there we have Johanna Lochner coming to us from Chile in South America. Good to have you with us. One gets a feeling that something really special is happening, um, something so special that it's way beyond anything we can do as individuals. But when people seek to come together to solve problems, as opposed to oppositionalizing them, you know that you're part of a moment in time that is super special. And how fantastic is it that this forum, um, the Leadership Conservation Forum and um, Screen Share Africa can bring us together in remarkable ways like this. So thank you all so much and have a wonderful evening and great week ahead. Uh, I think that's all from us. Thanks guys. Thank you for all your knowledge that you shared and I hope our lives can be changed going forward. Thank you very much.